Canada's central Arctic region, from the vast expanse of King William Island and the hamlet of Joe Haven to Victoria Island and the Arctic hub of Cambridge Bay, a cultural timeline stretching back thousands of years. We have a lot of uh, cultural activities here in Cambridge Bay and one of them we performed was the drum dancing. Searching for the Northwest Passage. The explorers came through here and they wintered here for three years in 1903. And explorers carrying on that tradition. You can't afford to push it in this place. Uh, if it lets you out, it lets you out. Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada over the edge. High above Canada's central Arctic region, the waters of Wellington Strait lead to Cape Norton and one of Canada's most remote inhabited islands. King William Island is located just north of the North American mainland, part of the Arctic archipelago. It is a vast open frontier, measuring more than 13,000 square kilometers. It is the 15th largest island in Canada and the 61st largest in the world. King William Island is located in the heart of Canada's Northern Territory, known as Nunavut. It is also part of Nunavut's Kitikmiot region, a massive expanse measuring more than 450,000 square kilometers. Most of the region is uninhabited, home to less than 5,000 people, spread across remote communities like Talawiak, Kugluktuk, and Cambridge Bay. They are only accessible by sea or air. And here, on the southeastern extremity of King William Island, we approach one of the region's best-known settlements. It is the hamlet of Joe Haven. Joe Haven is located just north of the 68th parallel, one degree above the Arctic Circle. It is 2,100 kilometers north of the city of Winnipeg and the only settlement on King William Island. For much of the year, Joe Haven is covered in snow. Winter temperatures can reach minus 40 degrees Celsius. Sea ice surrounds the hamlet for nine months of the year. But in the heat of Arctic summer, Joe Haven enjoys 24-hour sunlight from May 22nd to July 21st. And the rare warmth reveals one of Nunavut's most unique landscapes. Arctic desert stretches for kilometers with vast expanses of sand covering the limestone bedrock below. Joe Haven was officially established in 1961 with the opening of a trading post by the Hudson's Bay Company, a Canadian fur trading operation dating back to 1670. 
Today, it is home to roughly 1,100 people. But local Inuit have called this region home for centuries. They are known as the Netsilingmut peoples, translated people of the place where there is sea. Together, they carry on the traditions of the past. Uh, my name is Katya Kirchner, and this is my friend Janet Agluka, and we're both throat singers from Joe Haven, Nunavut. Long ago, the, the woman would um, throat sing when the men go out hunting, so time can go a bit faster, and they would throat sing when they have gatherings like drum dancing. Throat singing is considered one of the world's oldest forms of music. It is a vocal technique used by cultures around the world and one that Janet Aglukuk remembers fondly growing up in Joe Haven. I learned how to throat sing when I was maybe 11, 12. And it was really dry at first, the first time I learned, but I got used to it. And then I taught Kathy, and it was the same for her. We've known each other since we were kids in school. Best friends. Yeah. She taught me how to throat sing. It was hard at first, because each time we throat sing, we would stop quickly and laugh. <laughs> but we got used to it, now we throat sing longer. The unique sound is nearly impossible to explain. New listeners say it is a combination of chanting, singing and growling, with body movement keeping the rhythm. The way we start off throat sing is we turn towards each other and we hold each other on like the elbow or the upper arm and it's to move so we how do, how do you say it? It's hard to throat sing when we're just standing there and not moving and it's much easier when we do this when and we like move. hold each other yeah yeah it's like a rhythm and while the songs may sound similar, they all have different meanings, well known to local performers and listeners alike. Today, throat singing thrives in Joe Haven. And after more than two decades, it continues to be a source of inspiration for best friends Kathy Cooknook and Janet Aglukuk. Yeah, it's, it's important to continue or keep the throat singing alive because that's what our ancestors did. And it's, it's fun, it's exciting, it's funny, and it's just nice to learn. And they want to keep it going. Kids learn and they... Pass it on to the yeah. younger, younger generations. The hamlet of Joe Haven boasts one of the Arctic's most unique cultural landscapes. And while the Inuit timeline stretches back centuries, 
Joe Haven may be best known for its connection to early European explorers. For more than a century, Joe Haven has been a hub for adventurers seeking a maritime route through the Arctic Ocean, linking east and west. That route has come to be known as the Northwest Passage. My name is Jacob Kernach. I'm the uh, chairperson for the Natchelik Heritage Society here in Joe Haven. The Inuk Tidil name for Joe Haven is Ukhruktok, meaning that uh, land of uh, seal blubber. We have a lot of ring seal, that's probably why it's called Ukhruktok, meaning um, a lot of blubber. Since the 19th century, explorers like John Ross, Roald Amundsen, and John Franklin have passed through Joe Haven. Roald Amundsen even spent two winters here, naming Joe Haven the finest little harbor in the world. The name of Joe is, is off, off um, Amundsen's um, sailboat. I believe his name was, the, the boat's name was Joe, and that's how this community became Joe Haven. The, the, the explorers came through here and they wintered here for three years in 1903 around that area and that's how it, after that it became uh, a trading post and people start settle, settling here uh, around the uh, 1960s. Through oral history, Jacob Kahunik recalls first contact between his people and the first Europeans, a tense meeting that eventually grew into a lasting friendship. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. My ancestors said that uh, the, the explorers were carrying their rifles when they were meeting up with our local Inuit people. Um, to my knowledge, that was given to me. They slowly walked to each other. Um, that's how they met. The explorers eventually got knowledge from these Inuit people and that's, that was a main way of uh, surviving up here and I think that's, that's why they made it through the Northwest Passage. Today, a variety of buildings survive from Joe Haven's early days, including the community's original trading post. This, this building here in, in my background is one of the oldest buildings that we have here in Joe Haven. It was once a trading post uh, without heat. Um, trappers would trade um, Arctic fox, polar bear, um, ring seal, uh, wolverine. Um, but back then, the main, the main trading was the Arctic white fox, and a lot of it happened here in the back, uh, in the building here. Um, it's owned, it was once owned by Hudson Bay Company, now it's owned by Northern Store. But the best view is found on a hill overlooking town, an homage to this unique port. We're at the end of the harbor and it's one of the most important places. It's more like a historic place. Um, we have a Peterhead boat behind me, which was owned by the uh, missionary, Roman Catholic. It did a lot of traveling, picking up people, uh, moving people, um, moving a lot of supplies to other community as well. Behind me is a Karen and there's information on Franklin and also uh, the first explorer that came through this Northwest Passage, Ronald Amundsen. And um, he was the first explorer that ever traveled through the Northwest Passage. For Jacob Kahunik, stories of adventure and exploration are a unique aspect of this region, but just a small part 
of why he calls Joe Haven home. I moved here in 1965 with my parents and ever since I've been living here, I had my school here. I do my hunting, I do my, um, I'm, I work here before and um, as of today, it's, it's huge. When I first moved here, there were probably around 50 people. Now it's a, a population of 1,300. Continuing west, we soar above the vast western expanse of King William Island. Here, limestone, gravel, and sand line the horizon. And while the landscape is flat, it is not dull. Ethereal colors stretch as far as the eye can see. On the coast, a maze of sandbars, capes, and tiny peninsulas stretch for kilometers, including Gladman Point, McClintock Bay, and Cape John Herschel. And on the ground, we see one of King William Island's most unique features. This is the Gladman Point radar station, an odd sight on the Arctic tundra. It is a Cold War relic, part of the distant early warning system built in the 1950s to detect the movement of Soviet aircraft. At that time, dozens of stations lined the 69th parallel from Alaska to the Eastern Arctic. Today, the Cold War Dew Line has been disbanded. Gladman Point and 46 other radar stations from the Dew Line era are part of a new surveillance system a joint Canadian-U.S. operation known as the Northern Warning System. Fifty kilometers further, we trace the western perimeter of King William Island. Beyond Hornby Island, we reach the open waters of Alexandria Strait. Alexandria Strait separates King William Island from the Royal Geographical Society Islands to the west. These barren islands were named by explorer Roald Amundsen more than a century ago. And the waters surrounding remain a mystery, largely uncharted. but they are home to an abundance of wildlife, including the awe-inspiring beluga whale.
belugas thrive in Arctic waters, traveling in pods like this one. They measure four to six meters in length, weighing more than 1,000 kilograms. They are majestic mammals of the sea and can live up to 50 years. West of Alexandria Strait and the Royal Geographical Society Islands, we approach the waters of Victoria Strait and the heart of the Northwest Passage. The European quest to complete the passage can be traced as early as 1819, when Edward Perry's mission ventured north into uncharted waters, west of Resolute, into Peel Sound. Other missions followed, many with tragic results. Finally, in 1903, Roald Amundsen chose a tiny six-man crew in a converted herring vessel he called Joe and embarked on a three-year journey, the first explorer to complete the Northwest Passage. Today, these waters continue to intimidate many modern mariners, but not all. Some continue to be drawn to these icy waters. I'm Jesse Osborne, captain of sailing vessel Empiricus, and uh, here sailing the Northwest Passage with my fiance. Well, you'd be surprised how many people don't know what the Northwest Passage is. It's cold and there's not much known about it. To sum it up, I'd just say it's challenging. Osborne is in the thick of a multi-year expedition to make it through the Northwest Passage from Alaska to Greenland. I started this journey in 2012, but I didn't get very far that year and I ran out of money. So uh, I went from Seward, Alaska to Kodiak Island in 2012. And then after working for a year, uh, began the major leg of the trip, which was last year, from Kodiak Island, out around the Aleutian chain, then up over the top of Alaska over Point Barrow, and then ended up in Cambridge Bay last year. And that's where we stopped the vessel in 2013. This year, Osborne and fiance Samantha Merritt have encountered tough weather from Cambridge Bay to Joe Haven. Today, they continue to wait on board their prize vessel for ice in the passage to clear. This is where I've done, well, all my sailing. This is the boat that I learned how to sail on. Empiricus is a 50-foot gaff-rigged yawl, and it was built by taking a 1943 Navy Liberty launch, a Navy lifeboat, and laying a one-inch fiberglass hull all the way around it. So the, the old wooden boat was used as the shape of the hull, but then it was left inside as a building platform. So it's about three inches thick everywhere. And at the, all the way up at the bow, it's 18 inches thick of uh, stainless steel, fiberglass, and cypress. So this is a tough, tough boat. It's uh, got a nine foot beam. It's about 42 feet on deck. And uh, right now she tips the scales about 38,000 pounds. So heavy, heavy boat. Uh, I'll explain what we got on the deck here. This is, uh, this is all firewood. We no longer need the fuel range that we did when we started the voyage, so 
cut these tops out and stuffed them full of firewood for our stove. We've got diesel fuel in this one and gasoline in the uh, in that all the way aft container. This is the mainsail here. It's about 435 square feet, if I remember correctly. That's the first sail I ever built. It's a triple reefed mainsail and real heavy cloth, and, and uh, so far I haven't had any problems with it, so excited about that. Headed forward here, we have the main mast, which custom boats a lot of times use very interesting things that you wouldn't suspect. Actually, both the masts on this boat are uh, aluminum light poles, and they're just outstanding. Light poles are made to shear off at the bolts if a car hits them, and the rest of the pole is very tough. This boat's been through, uh, well, it'll take a lot more than I can, so. Below deck, Samantha Merritt reveals the preparations for this epic journey. Hello, welcome aboard Empiricus. This is uh, a sailboat, but uh, it's also our home. Um, show you around. When you come in the companionway, we have a, uh, the engine controls, navigation, this is kind of the business end, um, power bank, VHF radio. The other side here is the galley, it's the kitchen, boat speak. Uh, we have about 300 pounds of food just in the galley in a couple big deep wells uh, that go below the waterline, keeps everything cool. And then we also have food storage uh, forward. And beyond the kitchen, Merritt reveals a few comforts of home and their source of heat for temperatures that may drop below zero on the autumn Arctic seas. Through here in the cabin is uh, a bookshelf and uh, we have a couple settees where you can sit down couches, essentially. Uh, my favorite item in the boat is the wood stove. Uh, I love being warm, and uh, I only agreed to sail the Northwest Passage because Jesse had a wood stove. <laughs> Moving forward towards the front of the boat, this is the mast. Goes right down into the keel. And uh, the stateroom, which is what they call bedrooms on boats. Yeah. Our bunk is here. There's a bunk. Uh, ordinarily, somebody could sleep here, but we have a lot of winter gear uh, stowed, ready to go. It is tight, compact quarters. And in the heart of their living area, Merritt reveals one of the most crucial aspects of the operation. Uh, this is probably the most important place on the boat. It's our, our nav table. We started this year's voyage in Cambridge Bay. We're now on the south part of King William Island. And today we're going to leave and head north and east into St. Roche Basin. Uh, and then along uh, the James Ross Strait on the west shore of the Boothia Peninsula. Then we're going to cross the Baffin Bay and go over to Greenland. This is sound really easy, but it's probably going to take about two weeks. Osborne and Merritt have invested years of their lives in this journey. But after two winters, months of physical labor, and countless expenses, they remain optimistic. We have, uh, you know, the ice is starting to, to open up north of here between us and Bellet Strait. And um, it's a mixture of trying to get to Bellet Strait as early as possible without running into too much ice and putting ourselves in a pinch situation. Um, the reason for that is, is we want to cross Baffin Bay and get to Greenland before September really starts rolling on. So, uh, so that's our goal. There's not a lot on this planet that hasn't been done, and there are very few things that have been done very little. And this voyage for me raised the bar to a level that forced me to get better at what I love doing. I studied uh, Roald Amundsen simply because he was the one that made it, and so many didn't. And so many books were written about people who didn't make it through the Northwest Passage, but they had this great awful story to tell. So uh, although Amundsen came through here like 110 years ago, everything that he did, all the, all the tactics he used were very, very valid and they worked for a reason. That's one of the reasons we didn't get in a hurry last year and we decided to stop in Cambridge Bay because you can't afford to push it in this place. Uh, if it lets you out, it lets you out. But uh, 
It's more of a tortoise and a hare routine. Slow and steady wins the race. West of Victoria Strait and the waters of the Northwest Passage, Victoria Island is a welcome sight. Victoria Island measures more than 200,000 square kilometers, roughly the size of Great Britain. But while Great Britain has a population of 64 million people, Victoria Island is home to less than 2,000. It is the second largest island in Canada and the eighth largest in the world. Like King William Island to the east, Victoria Island is dotted by tiny lakes and rivers. It is also home to formidable land mammals. Muskox, known to Inuit as the Umingmak, are a breathtaking sight here. They roam the tundra, covered by a thick fur and an incredible inner coat locals call kiviat. It is said to be one of the lightest and warmest wolves on earth. On the ground, Dozens of tiny plant species have evolved to endure harsh winters here. Arctic plants are like icebergs. Roughly 95% of their mass is underground, storing valuable nutrients for spring. Amazingly, some Arctic seeds can remain preserved even when frozen for 10,000 years. One hundred twenty kilometers inland, the topography of Victoria Island begins to change. Vast expanses of tundra are replaced by soaring hills as we approach Mount Pelly. Mount Pelly is one of three hills that line the horizon, set in an area known as Oveic Territorial Park. These hills represent one of the great cultural legends of the region. Oral tradition says a family of giant Inuit were traversing Victoria Island in search of food. After weeks of starvation, the mother giant collapsed and died, 
creating one hill. Then the sun collapsed, creating another. Finally, the father Oveik fell, leaving behind one of the best known landmarks in the region. Stories like these are key to the cultural fabric of Victoria Island and the nearby community of Cambridge Bay. The stories and the local language are preserved by elders and organizations like the Katitmiot Heritage Society and the Katitmiot Inuit Association. My name is Pamela Gross, and I'm the program manager at the Kitakamut Heritage Society in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. The mandate for the society is to integrate traditional um, knowledge and language, so Inuinoctun um, language into the society and the practice that we do through delivering cultural programming. We currently have five elders and residents at the Kitilmute Heritage Society, and um, so for eight months of the year, they come in part time to work with us. We do programming that involves the elders quite frequently, and working with the the children um, is something that we like to do a lot because um, we want to share the knowledge from not only the elders to the adults, but also to the children. So we do sewing during the day, and we also have cultural programming in the summers as well. Across town, Julia Owina is active in preserving another form of Inuit culture, traditional drum dance. We have a lot of uh, cultural activities here in Cambridge Bay, and um, we've been planning some for the last number of years for language maintenance and um, revitalization and one of them we performed is the drum dancing where it's passed on through not only generations but it's traveled across from the far west as far as Russia as far as Alaska through to the Delta and to Uluqaqtor NWT's most um, northeast community to here in Cambridge in Nunavut. While drumming is similar throughout the North, each region has its own distinct style. There's differences in clothing, differences in dance styles. Our songs are shorter, they're more rhythmic and more upbeat. The first set of dances, um, the girls will be dancing to will be um Okumaksiut is um, the story of the dance where people are traveling back inland from their summer uh, summer camps along the coast. The first dancers we have on the floor are my daughter Trisha, Kalinda, and Sarah. And I'm Julia, and my husband Jerry. Julia Owina says her association has seen positive results by promoting drum dancing. She believes activities like this are important for the growth of the community. It tells people who we are and where we come from. Um, dance, stories, a lot of the stories that are passed on from generation to generation is passed on through song and through dance. And um, since joining, we've been able to expand it to the youth in the community and the school in the community. And we have had a lot more people join. 
I think this is special because um, Inuit are a people that lived on the land solely from the land. Um, my grandmother's generation lived on the land and she moved into the community when she was a young adult and she's a unilingual speaker and for me I can't speak to my grandmother. I need a translator and we need to do more to help people that are not fluent in the language pass on what they know to us so that we don't lose who we are through our language. Fifteen kilometers west of Mount Pelly and Oveok Territorial Park, Cambridge Bay is a major hub of the Central Arctic region. It is home to more than 1,400 people, the largest stop for tourists and research vessels traveling through the region. Amazingly, archeological sites here indicate a human presence dating back 4,000 years, a timeline that coincides with the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. And like Joe Haven to the east, Cambridge Bay holds a strong connection to the early explorers of the Northwest Passage. Here in the harbor, the shipwreck Maud has been a landmark for more than 80 years. Named for the Queen of Norway, the ship once belonged to Northwest Passage pioneer Roald Amundsen, before being sold to the Hudson's Bay Company. It was later used as a floating warehouse and wireless station until it sank in 1930. Today, Plans are in place to bring the mod back home to Norway. And just meters away, on Cambridge Bay's lone pier, a unique vessel makes its summer home. The Martin Bergman is a research vessel dedicated to scientific, cultural, and archeological study. It is named after one of Canada's most renowned Arctic scientists, killed in a 2011 plane crash, 700 kilometers to the northeast. My name is Adrian Shemnowski. I'm the operations director for Arctic Research Foundation, and we are standing here in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. The Martin Bergman is a converted vessel. It was a trawling vessel from Newfoundland. Um, Martin Bergman uh, was one of the founders with this, for this idea, along with Jim Bosley and Tim McDonald. And uh, through their conversation, they decided that it would be a, a good thing to bring a small research vessel to the Arctic. The reason why the vessel stays here in Cambridge Bay is that the season is short. and. Um, Cambridge Bay is a perfect location to have a vessel and when the ice uh, clears, we are able to start science work immediately. Um, if we are on the west or east coast and having to transit back and forth, we would never really get that full opportunity. This summer, the Martin Bergman will take part in multiple studies, gathering water samples, tracking Arctic char, even collecting soapstone for local artists. So this is our galley and mess. So it's uh, quite a small space, but we have everything that a typical kitchen would have. Uh, we have 12 people on board and we work 24 hours. 
So usually when it's time to dinner, we'll have six eating at a time, switching out. We are now on the bridge. So this is where all the fun happens on the ship. This is where we have all our instrumentation, our uh, GPS satellite. Also, this is where the Parks Canada crew set their uh, survey equipment. This is the lab space on the RV Martin Bergman. Um, in this lab space, we we check over AUV equipment or other scientific scientific equipment. Today, the crew is preparing for their most anticipated mission of the summer. This AUV, or autonomous underwater vehicle, is a remote controlled probe that will be used to search for the lost ships of Sir John Franklin, last seen in 1845. Experts believe the HMS Erebus and HMS Terror sank not far from Joe Haven, off King William Island. Along with our vessel, we'll be rendezvousing with uh, the Coast Guard vessel Laurier, also uh, a Navy vessel and uh, a private ocean, uh, oceans, one oceans north. And together, this group of ships will be surveying and deploying different launches uh, in a coordinated effort. Personally, I, uh, I'm excited to be part of the project. Every day, I, I learn more about the Arctic. Um, the collaborations with our partners is always growing. Um, and it's interesting to be part of history. Well, this story, uh, it kind of describes what it's like in the north. Uh, the environment is always changing. Whether it was 200 years ago or currently, we're always faced with the same conditions, that uh, weather can be unpredictable, it's harsh climate. Um, you could have all the technology in the world, but you're still going to face uh, the Arctic, the climate. And as the Martin Bergman sets sail, crew members are unaware they will soon be part of one of the world's great marine archaeological discoveries. The Martin Bergman and its autonomous underwater vehicle is just days away from playing a key role in locating the HMS Erebus that has been lost for nearly 170 years. From the waters of Wellington Strait and the rugged contours of King William Island to the jagged icy currents of Victoria Strait to the soaring slopes of Mount Pelly and Oveak Territorial Park The landscapes and waterways of Canada's central Arctic region are marked by barren beauty and cultural wonders. It is a mix of centuries old traditions bold new adventures inspiring wildlife. On a world famous waterway, a Northwest Passage, continues to be discovered here on the edge of Canada.